Welcome to the car guys and welcome to the Ferrari Roma. I'm going to take you through all aspects of this car. I'm going to tell you exactly what it's like to drive, what it's like from an owner of Ferraris and whether I could ever see one of these coming to the car guys garage. So if that sounds good with you, let's crack on. So here we are then, the Ferrari Roma. It was launched in Rome in 2019 to a select group of clients. I wasn't one of them. The way I'm looking at the Roma is it's a potential replacement for that Porsche 911 turbo position. The ludicrously fast supercar with a bit of badge cachet and importantly, extra seats in the back. So a bit more practicality. Styling-wise, I find it sleek and elegant, but not particularly dramatic. This front grille for me is a bit Marmite. I'm not a huge fan of it, even in body color, which I think it does look better in. I don't really see any lines I'm particularly excited about with the car. And overall, it kind of just looks like a generic swoopy GT car. The design at the back is quite interesting. It sort of curves round and you've got a big old carbon diffuser, four big tailpipes and these semi-futuristic lights. Boot wise, I'm a little concerned because it does seem pretty small. You've got small back seats and the boot is small. So let's say you could fit two kids in the back. Where are you gonna put all of their stuff? I also find the opening of the boot pretty clunky. It doesn't really open itself, which I think it should for this sort of price bracket. And there isn't a button that you press to close it. So you have to do it yourself. And sometimes you whack your hand while you do it. This car's got the optional carbon side skirts, which help make the car look lower. You've got a frankly unnecessarily enormous fuel filler cap back here. And I have to say, I am no fan of these door handles. You've got a cover plate and you jam your fingers inside. It then electronically pushes the door against your fingers in the opposite direction, which seems a bit odd. And all I can feel in here is sort of weird rough edges. It's just not a nice experience for a car in this sort of luxury segment. You pull open the door, and inside the cabin. All the finery from the SF90, all in a compact, high quality package. The steering wheel incidentally is smaller and thinner as it is on the F8 Tributo and the SF90. And is it just me, or does it feel like you're holding a PlayStation controller? You pull the lever on the seats and they electronically move forward and then you've got the actual rear seats. Unless you are an amputee in the front and a midget in the back, it's gonna get a bit tight. The Roma also has a sort of keyless entry and exit system. So you get out of the car holding the key, walk away, it beeps and it all locks up. And then as you approach the car, it beeps again. If you're running to and from the car at your house, it's constantly beeping and locking and beeping and locking. See what I mean? It's a bit annoying, to be honest. The engine is a 3.9 litre twin turbo V8. You can see how far back it is, but it does pack a mighty punch. 0 to 60 is 3.4 seconds. 0 to 124 is 9.3 seconds. The engine delivers 611 brake horsepower, which is 619 PS, and it goes on to a top speed of 199 miles an hour. What's really impressive, though, is the torque. 560 foot-pounds, which is 760 newton meters. Weight wise, the Roma is 1472 kilograms dry and 1570 wet. So that's pretty much all you need to know about this car. Now I think it's time to take it for a drive and explain exactly what it's like to own and hustle one of these through some corners. So here we are, first time in a Ferrari Roma. And believe me, there is lots to say. This is a very comfortable car with a vast amount of technology in it. It's a real technological tour de force. You have this symmetrical cockpit, which has many of the features that were first unveiled in the SF90. So they are Ferrari state of the art. I love these little Buck Rogers switches that you have here on this enormous center console that splits the cabin in two. You've got a splash of carbon on here, lots of controls, but then it is somewhat spoiled by having this massive carbon fiber Ferrari tablet wedged into the top. It sticks out, it's got all sorts of weird angles on it. It's just not a nice looking thing. 
Now the Roma uses the same look steering wheel as the SF90, the dashboard is very similar, and you've got haptic controls all over the place. The steering wheel's got one for your thumb, you've got real buttons for some functions like the indicators and the wipers and the full beam, but then you've got a sort of master control joystick that's entirely haptic and touch sensitive, which takes a little bit of time to get used to. Basically, you need smooth, positive movements, not stabbing. I've got a state-of-the-art dashboard ahead of me. Everything is digital and configurable and switchable as you drive. It's actually quite fun to use the haptic control to sweep left or right and go through the different modes until you find one that suits you. Can you hear that? That's me flicking between the menus, kind of like you do on a smartphone. It's a neat system. Remember, modern Ferraris allow you to configure everything. So you've got to have very detailed sets of menus to control it all. I've currently got a configuration with the nav on the left, the rev counter front and center, and then to the right, I've got a detailed status diagram which shows me the tire pressures and all of the temperatures. And you can change the color of the rev counter if you want. And Ferrari still hasn't cottoned onto the fact that you could upload packs which would allow you to have any Ferrari dial from any age and any model instead of the standard. That's the beauty of digital. Imagine how cool it would be driving a Roma but having the dials from a 250 GTO. If you want a party piece with the dashboard of this car, all you've got to do is engage the haptic controls and sweep your thumb across the view max button because what that does is it makes the entire dashboard just one view. In this case, it's all sat nav and it is bonkers. The overriding feeling though in the cockpit is of luxury and sophistication. By, oh, that stop start. Honestly, that stop start is really starting to piss me off. You only have to cruise up to a junction and it cuts off immediately. It's way too sensitive and I have yet to find the off button so I may have to stop and do that because it really annoys me in fact I've just found it it's down here to my right hand over by the door it's it's on a haptic control let's see what happens there you go stop start eliminated thank god for that one thing that's slightly odd is that the Manatino, or the stalwart of Ferraris, all the way back to, I think, the 430, is still on the steering wheel, and it is still a physical knob, but when you turn it, it tells you what mode you're in on the screen. So you've got this sort of slight disconnect where you move with your fingers, but you look with your eyes up at the dashboard, and that sort of ties into Ferrari's current trend of eyes on the road, hands on the wheel. The idea is, is that you're always looking forward and everything you need is right in front of you. In some ways it's a little bit nonsensical because of course if everything is so tiny and electronic then although you are technically staring at the road what you're actually doing is squinting at the tiny details on the dashboard and not actually looking at the road perhaps as much as you should. One little feature I do like is that the bumpy road button, which used to be on the steering wheel, you now push the Manatino to access that feature in anything above the comfort mode. The central tablet has many different tiny indistinguishable icons and symbols. It's touch screen and all of the ventilation controls and a lot of the other ancillary controls are on it. The downside is, of course, make sure you sort it all before you get going because on the move, you're jiggling about and you're gonna be pressing the wrong thing all the time. Everything is quite small and close together, so the chance of hitting the wrong button and causing something unexpected to happen is quite high. You also notice immediately that if you decide to spec a Roma for yourself and you go for a light interior, what you need to do is make sure that you specify the bit that goes around the dashboard in black, because if you don't, you will have an enormous prominent white U reflected in the windscreen all the time. Now there's no doubting that the quality of the dashboard, the detail, the amount of information and the way it works is state of the art. It is fantastic and if all Ferraris of the future have this system then we're going to be okay. You also get in this car a passenger display which gives them lots of interesting information. None of it I particularly want them to know, but it does at least allow them to contribute in terms of changing the audio and media, which of course in older Ferraris, they could not. 
you also have a huge number of warning klaxons and bells and whistles going off all the time if you deviate even slightly from what the car believes you should be doing. Try flicking it into a quick reverse manoeuvre for example. And it'll sound and look like the control room at Chernobyl. Let's press on a little bit. Let's give it a little bit of the bean, shall we? Here we go. Oh, oh, blimey. There is some serious grunt available here. Look at that. It's got over 500 foot-pounds of torque, this thing. 760 odd Newton meters. That is too fast for this road. And that does highlight one of the strange things about this car. It's a relaxed cruiser, and yet it will rip your face off. And obviously it stops like a Ferrari should as well. The brakes are phenomenal. There is a satisfying roar that you get from the engine. Remember this is a twin turbo, but I have to say, I think the engine is a little bit too loud. It's a bit too raw for the rest of the character of the car. This is a car that should purr with a satisfying V8 burble going on, but often it actually sounds like a NASCAR and it gives it a real Jekyll and Hyde quality. I don't think anyone can have any complaint with the dynamics and the power delivery of this car. There is no hint that it is a turbo engine. There's no lag whatsoever, instant response and a lot of response. Of course, it does all come with that F1 technology to keep it on the road. You've got the side slip control three, you've got the F1 track, the electronic differential, and you've got the dynamic enhancer systems which break all the different wheels. Boy, with this kind of speed, you are gonna need that. The steering is ultra, ultra light, which does give you a lot of confidence and allows you to make maneuvers quickly and easily, but there is almost no feel whatsoever. This car is painted in Mirabelle blue, which actually in the bright sunshine is quite nice. I don't think it's as nice as Tour de France, but I think it's fair to say that as pretty as the car can be from many angles, I've not seen one that's made me absolutely lose my mind and want one. And really, at my time of life, this is the sort of car that I should be considering. You know, I don't think the point of this car is to make you go, wow, I think it's a lot more sophisticated and chic. I think it's meant to be a lot more anonymous, a car that you love and looks elegant, but doesn't shout about it. The design certainly has a whiff of the 50s and 60s Italian cars from that La Dolce Vita period. But although the exterior takes lots of cues from 50s and 60s cars, the interior most certainly doesn't. But there are a few things that actually are annoying me a bit about this car, and I didn't really expect it. To be honest, a lot of them are to do with unnecessary electrical items or assistance. I don't particularly like the door handles. Same thing with opening the door. You don't pull a lever in Aroma, you press a button and it disengages. All very fine, but what happens when the fuse goes? Or there's an electrical gremlin? What happens then? I'm stuck in the car, I can't get out. The haptic touch system, once you get used to it, is quite smooth and can be pleasurable, but I do get the fact that it's easy to accidentally swipe or press and activate some function that you didn't want. Now, fortunately, my background is in video games, so it's actually quite natural for me to use controls like this. This car has the eight-speed gearbox from the SF90, and for me, eight gears is at least one too many. This car does do one of my pet hates, which is if you are doing 22 miles an hour, it could be in eighth gear, which is just ludicrous. Going all the way up through the gears to get the maximum possible fuel efficiency at the complete expense of any driver feel or involvement. So first order of the day for me was to flick it into manual mode so that I've got the control and stop that from happening. Rear visibility is a little bit limited. It's a bit pillar boxy back there. Because the roof slopes down and the boot flicks up, you do get quite a small field of vision. A couple of things to highlight about the driving dynamics of the Roma. On initial turn in, you do get a slight tilt in the body shell, and so you do move over quite a bit more than you do in the mid-engine cars. This is actually exacerbated by the fact that these seats don't really have that much support. They're actually quite shallow. How about a healthy dollop of beans well, now that we're on a slightly bigger road? Here we go. 
to make sure it's not too bumpy. See the engine, you can hear it. It's a lot of noise there. And... Seamless gear changes as you'd expect. Yeah, I mean, this is a quick car. It's far quicker than it actually needs to be. So how do I sum up the Roma? What do I like and dislike? Well, in terms of likes, it's got to be the power. The power delivery, the composure of the car over rough surfaces. I really like the additional practicality, especially now that the GTC4 Lusso has gone. And I have to say, I'm a big fan of that symmetrical cabin and all of that dash and SF90 gubbins that they've got in here. It really does take Ferrari's cabins to a whole new level. And I can see this car appealing to both men and women. And I think if you owned one of these instead of say a Porsche 911 Turbo or a 911 Targa, I think you'd be pretty happy. What do I dislike? That tablet inside and the operation of the controls not associated with the steering wheel. I'm not a fan of needless electricery. So the door handles inside and out are not pleasurable to use and I do worry about their longevity. I think the engine is perhaps a bit too boomy and a bit too loud for a luxurious cruiser that this is trying to be. There's a little bit too much haptic going on in the car as well. I think it's possibly gone a bit too far, but I think for me, the biggest issue overall is the exterior styling. I just think it's too anonymous. It doesn't stand out enough for me. On the plus side, it's definitely more usable as a daily because it's not like taking some exotic supercar to the shops. It should pretty much stay under the radar. You can tuck it into a car park and no one will really notice it. So in a way, I guess that's successful. And if that's what you're looking for, bingo, they've delivered. If you like what we're doing on the car guys, please subscribe, leave comments and likes. There'll be another car guys episode along next week. Yeah.